Story 17 of the Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 17, Genius, by Eleanor Mordaunt, from Hutchinson's Magazine and The Century Magazine, 1921-1922. Part 2 No wonder she had passed it, with all she had expected at the back of her mind. The strip of pavement outside was dark, with not so much as a single taxi in sight. The door half shut, the dreary vestibule badly lighted, empty, smelling of damp, the sodden-looking sketch of a man in the pay-box seemed half asleep, stretched, yawned when she spoke, pushing a strip of pink paper towards her as she gave her name. For two, he poked out a long neck and peered round the edge of the box like a tortoise from its shell. The other lady was it not able to come to-night, answered Jenny with dignity, and the beast grinned, displaying a wreckage of broken teeth. "'Ain't not what you might call a crowd anyway,' he remarked. She could have killed him for that. She realized the white face of a clock, but she would not look at it. She was early, that was it. Look how she had hurried. No wonder that she was early. And great ladies were always late. She had learnt that from the Daily Mail stories. Two and two make four, them too late, and me too early,' she said to herself, with a gallant effort after her own brisk way of taking things, a surer tap of heels on the stone floor as she turned towards a swing door to her left, pushed it open, and was hit in the face by what seemed like a thick black curtain. A dim, white-gloved hand was thrust through it and took her ticket. Mind you don't fall. No good wasting the lights until they come, if ever they does come exhorted and explained a voice out of the darkness, for, after all, it was not a curtain, but just darkness. At first Jenny could see nothing. Then, little by little, it seemed as though different objects crept forward, one by one, like wild animals from their lair. Those white patches, the hands of two white-gloved men, holding sheaves of programs, she realized one between her own fingers, whispering together. There was the platform, the great piano sprawling over it, and in front of this rows and rows and rows, and rows upon rows, of empty seats. She looked behind her. They had argued long over the question of places for herself and his mother. The very best, that's what Ben had said, but they fought against this, fought and conquered, for the best seats meant money. What's a seat, more or less, I'd like to know? Money, all money! Old Mrs. Cohen had been firm upon this point. Still, there were a great many seats yet further back, and all empty. A little raised, seeming to push themselves forward, with the staring vacuity of an idiot. More seats overhead in a curving balcony rising above each other as though proud of their emptiness. It would have been impossible to believe that mere vacant places could wear so sinister as well as foolish an aspect. An idiot, but a cruel idiot, too. The whole thing, one cruel idiot of the sort that likes to pull legs from flies. There was a clock there also. For a long while Jenny would not allow herself to look at it, but something drew her until it became an unbearable effort to keep her eyes away from it, to look anywhere else, and at last she turned her head, stared sharply, defiantly, as though daring it. It was five and twenty minutes to nine. Five and twenty minutes to nine, and the concert was to have begun at eight five and twenty minutes to nine, and there was no one there, no one, whatever. The clock hands dragged themselves on for another five minutes, then one of the men disappeared behind the scene, came back, 
speaking excitedly, gesticulating with white hands. "'We're to turn on the light. He swears as he won't give it up. He's going to play.' "'Going to play? Well, I'll be blowed. Going to play. And with nothing here but that!' Jenny saw how he jerked his head in her direction. So she was that. She, Jenny Bly, and so far gone that she did not even care. As the lights went up, the hall seemed to swim in a sort of mist. The terracotta walls, the heavy curtains at either side of the platform, those awful, empty seats. Jenny spread her skirt wide, catching at the chair to either side of her, stretching out her arms along the backs of them. She had a wild feeling as though it were up to her to spread herself sufficiently to cover them all. She half rose. Perhaps she could hide more of that emptiness if she moved nearer to the front. That was her thought. But no, she mustn't do that. This was the place Ben had chosen for her. She must stay where she was. He might look there, miss her, and imagine that there was nobody, nobody at all, that even she had failed him. If only she could spread herself, spread herself indefinitely, multiply herself, anything, anything to cover those beastly chairs, sticking out there, grinning, shaming her man. Then she had a sudden idea of running into the street, entreating the people to come in, was upon her feet for the second time when Ben walked on to the platform. For once he was not ducking or moving sideways. He came straight forward, bowed to the front of him, right and left, drew off his gloves, and bowed again. Mingling with her agony of pity, a thrill ran through Jenny Bly at this. He remembered her teaching. He was hers, 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 after all, hers, more than ever, hers. The borrowed coat, far too big for him, rose in a sort of hood at the back of his neck. As he bowed, something happened to the center stud of his shirt, and it disappeared into an aperture shaped like a dark gourd in the whiteness. But for all that, Jenny felt herself overawed by his dignity, as any one would have been. There was something in the man so much greater than his clothes, greater than his conscious, half-childish self. Jenny's hands were raised to clap, but they dropped into her lap, lay there, as, with a face set like marble, Ben turned and seated himself at the piano. There was a moment's pause while he stared straight in front of him, such a pause that a feeling of goose-flesh ran down the back of her arms. Then he began to play. Jenny had not even glanced at her program. She would have understood nothing of it if she had but it gave the Sonata Opus Three as the opening piece. Ben, however, took no notice of this, but for some reason he could not have explained, flung himself straightway into the third item, the tremendous Hammer Clavier. The sounds flooded the hall, swept through it as if it were not there, obliterating time and space. It was as though the heavenly host had descended upon the earth sweet, wonderful, and yet terrible, with a sweep of pinions, deep-drawn breath, two Balkane and his kind, deified, and yet human in their immense masculinity and strength. Jenny Bly was neither imaginative nor susceptible to sound, but it drew her out of herself. It was like bathing in a sea whose waves overpower one, so that, try as one may to cling to the earth, it slips off from beneath one's feet, shamed, beaten. She had a feeling that if it did not stop soon she would die, and would yet die when it did stop. Her heart beat thickly and heavily, her eyes were dim, she was bewildered, lost, and yet exhilarated. It was worse than an air raid, she thought, more exciting, more wonderful. The end left her almost as much exhausted as Ben himself. The sweat was running down his face as he got up from his seat, came forward to the front of the platform, and bowed right and left. 
Jenny had not clapped. She would as soon have thought of clapping God with his last trump, but Ben bowed as though a whole multitude had applauded him. By some chance, the only direction in which he did not turn his eyes was the gallery. Even then he might not have seen a single figure seated a little to one side, a man with a dark overcoat buttoned up to his chin, who clapped his two thumbs noiselessly together, drawing in his breath with a sort of whistle. "'That's the stuff,' he said. "'That's the stuff to give em. After a moment's pause, Ben turned again to the piano. This time he played the Sonata Pathétique in C minor, opus 13, then the Sonata Walstein in C major. Between each he got up, moved forward to the edge of the platform, and bowed. At the end of the Sonata, opus 3, by rights the first on the program, during the short interval which followed it, he straightened his shoulders with a sort of swagger, utterly unlike himself, swung round to the piano again, and slammed out, God save the king. He played it through to the very end, then rose, bowed from where he stood, stared round at the empty hall, a dreadful, strained, defiant smile stiffening upon his face, and sinking back upon his stool, laid his arms across the keyboard with a crash of notes, burying his head upon them. In a moment Jenny was out of her seat. There were chairs in her way, and she kicked them aside, raked one forward with her foot, and scrambled onto the platform, then catching a sideways glimpse of the empty seats, bent forward and shook her fist at them. Beasts! Pigs! Are you? The attendants had disappeared. The stranger was lost in shadows. There was nobody there but themselves. It would not have mattered if there had been. All the lords and ladies, all the swells in the world, would not have mattered. The great empty hall, suddenly friendly, closed, curving around them. Jenny dropped upon her knees at Ben's side, and flung her arms about him with little moans of love and pity slid one hand beneath his cheek with a muffled roll of notes, raised his head, and pressed it against her heart. There, my dear, there, my love, there, there, there. She laid her lips to his thick, dark hair in a passion of adoration, loving every lock of it, and then, womanlike, picked a white thread from off his black coat clasped him afresh with joy and sorrow like runnels of living water pouring through and through her. There, 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 there. He was too much of a child to fight against her. All his pride was gone. Oh, Jenny, 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 he cried. Then in an extremity of innocent anguish, amazement, they didn't come. They don't care. They don't want it. Jenny, they don't want it. Don't you worry about them, their blighters, my darling, selfish pigs. They ain't not worth a thought. Don't you worry about them. But Beethoven. Don't you worry about Beethoven, neifer. Ain't no better nor he oughter be. Take my word for it. Letting you in like this here. There, 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 my dear. They clung together, weeping rocking to and fro. Well, said the man in the gallery, I'm jiggered, and crept out very softly, stumbling a little because of the damp air, which seemed to have got into his eyes and made them smart. As the lovers came out into the little vestibule, clinging to each other, they did not so much as see the stranger, who stood talking to the man in the box office, but went straight out into the rain, with their umbrellas unopened in their hands. A good thing, as the all people insists upon payment in advance, remarked the man in the box office. The other gave him a curious, half-contemptuous glance. I'd like to hear you say that in a year's time. Why? Because that chap will be able to buy and sell a place like this a hundred times over by then. Queen's Hall, Albert Hall, I know. 
It's my business to know. There's something about his playing. That something different they're all out for. It took a long time to get back to Canning Town. Even Jenny had lost her certainty, her grasp of the ways of buses and such things. She felt oddly clear and empty, like a room swept and garnished with the sense of a ghost in some dim corner of it, physically sapped out. Ben clung to her. He said very little, but he clung to her with an odd, lost air, the look of a child who has been slapped in the face and cannot understand why. She was so much smaller than he, like a diminutive, sturdy steam-tug, and yet if she could have carried him, she would have done so. As it was, she threw her whole heart and soul into guiding, comforting, thinking of a hundred things at once, her soft mouth folded tight with anxiety. How to prevent him from feeling shamed before his mother? How to keep the troubles away from her? Though at the back of her own mind was a feeling, and she had an idea that it would be at the back of old Mrs. Cohen's also, of immense relief, of some load gone almost as though her child had been through a bad attack of scarlet fever or something which one does not take twice. With all this there was the thought of what she would step out and buy for their supper if the fried fish shop were still open, all she would do and say to cheer them. As for Ben, the Hammerclavier was surging through his brain, carrying the empty hall with it, those rows upon rows of empty seats swinging them to and fro, so that he felt physically sick, as though he were at sea. Quite suddenly, as they got out of the last tram, the rain ceased. At the worst it had been a mild night of velvety darkness and soft airs, the reflection from the lamps swimming in a haze of gold across the wet pavement. But now, just as they reached the end of his own street, the black sky opened upon a wide sea of pinkish amber, and a full moon sailed into sight. At the same moment, Ben's sense of anguished bewilderment cleared away, leaving in its place a feeling of incalculable weariness. To be back in his own home again, that was all he asked. You'll stay the night at our place, Jenny. Yes, I promised your mother. Her brow knitted, and then cleared again. Ah, well, that was all over. Ben would go back to his regular job again, they would get married, then there would be her money, too. No need for old Mrs. Cohen to do another hand's turn. Plenty of time for her to rest now, all her life for resting in. Your mother, as she spoke, Ben remembered for the first time, actively remembered, for of course it was his mother that he meant when he thought of home. She wasn't there, Jenny. She wasn't there. She was very busy, hadn't not finished her work. Something beyond Jenny's will stiffened within her. So he had only just realized it. She tried not to remember, but she could not help it. The flushed face, the glassy eyes, the whole look of a woman beaten with her back against a wall, condemning Ben by her very silence, desperate courage. Work? Yes, work. Jenny snapped it, hating herself for it, drawing him closer and yet unable to help it. Why? began Ben, and then stopped, horrified. At last he realized it. Perhaps it ran to him through Jenny's arm. Perhaps it was just that he was down on earth again, humble, ductile, seeing other people's lives as they were, not as he meant to make them. Ternight, workin'? All night, one the same as another. But why? he began again, stopped dead, loosed his own arm and caught hers. All this while workin' like that. She works too hard, Jenny. Look here, she works too hard. And I, this damned music. Look here, Jenny, it's got to stop. I'll never play a note again. She shall never do a hard stroke of work again. Never, never, not so long as I'm here to work for her. All my life, ever since I can remember, washing and ironing like, like the very devil. 
He pulled the girl along with him. That was what I was thinking all the time, to make a fortune so that you'd both have everything you wanted, a big house, servants, motors, silk dresses, and all the time letting you both work yourselves to death. But this is the end. No more of that. To be happy, that's all that matters. Sort of everyday happiness. No more of that beastly washing, ironing. It's the end of that, anyhow, when I'm back at the timber yard. He was like a child again, planning. They almost ran down the street. No more of that damned washing and ironing. No more work. True. How true. The street door opened straight into the little kitchen. She was not in bed, for the light was still burning. They could see it at either side of the blind, shrunk crooked with steam. There was one step down into the kitchen, but for all that the door would not open when they raised the latch and pushed it, stuck against something. Some of those beastly old clothes. Ben shoved it, hailing his mother. Mother! Mother! You've got something stuck against the door! Odd that she did not come to his help, quick as she always was. After all, it gave way too suddenly for him to altogether realize the oddness, and he stumbled forward right across the kitchen, seeing nothing until he turned and faced Jenny, still standing upon the step, staring downward with an ashy white face, wide eyes fixed upon old Mrs. Cohen, who lay there at her feet, resting, incomprehensibly resting. They need not have been so emphatic about it all. No more beastly washing, no more work, for the whole thing was out of their hands, once and for all. She had fallen across the doorway, a flat iron still in her hand, the weapon with which she had fought the world, kept the wolf from that same door, all the strain gone out of her face, a little twisted to the left side, and oddly smiling. One child's pinafore was still unironed. The rest were folded, finished. They raised her between them, laid her upon her bed. It was Jenny who washed her, wrapped her in clean linen. No one else should touch her. Ben, who sat by her with hardly a break, until the day that she was buried, wiped out with self-reproach, grief, desolate as any child, sodden with tears. He collected all his music into a pile, the day before the funeral, gave it to Jenny to put under the copper, a burnt offering. If it hadn't been for that, she might be here now. I don't want ever to see it again, ever to hear a note of it. That was what he said. Jenny went back to the house with him after the funeral. She was going to give him his tea, and then return to her own room. In a week they were to be married, and she would be with him for good, looking after him. That evening, before she left, she would set his breakfast, cut his lunch ready for the morrow. By Saturday week they would be settled down to their regular life together. She would not think about his music, pushed it away at the back of her mind over and done with, would not even allow herself the disloyalty of being glad. And yet was glad, deeply glad, relieved, despite her pride in it, in him, as though it were something unknown, alien, dangerous, like things forbidden. Two men were waiting at the door of the narrow slip of a house, the tall thin one with his overcoat still buttoned up to his chin, and another fat and shining, with a top hat, black frock coat, and white spats. "'About that concert,' said the first man, "'we were thinking that if we could persuade you to play,' put in the other. "'There was no one there,' interrupted Ben roughly. His shoulders were bent, his head dropped forward on his chest, poking sideways, his eyes sullen as a child's. I was there, put in the first man, and I must say impressed. Very deeply impressed, added the other. But once again Ben brushed him aside. You were there? At my concert? Jenny, standing a little back, for they were all three crowded upon the tiny doorstep, saw him glance up at the speaker with something luminous shining through the darkness of his face. 
at my concert? And you liked it? You liked it? Like is scarcely the word. We feel that if you could be persuaded to give another concert, put in the stout man blandly, and would allow... I shall never play again. Never, never, cried Ben harshly. But this time the other went on imperturbably. Allow us to make all arrangements, take all responsibility, boom you, see to the advertising, and all that. We thought if we were to let practically all the seats for the first concert go in complimentary tickets, get a few good names on the committee, perhaps a princess or something of that sort as a patroness, a strong clack. Of course, playing Beethoven, playing him as you played him the other night, grand, magnificent, put in the first man, realizing the weariness, the drop to blank indifference in the musician's face. The Hammer Clavier, for instance. It was magical. Oh, yes, yes, that, that. Ben's eyes widened, his face glowed. He hummed a bar or so. Was there ever anything like it? My God, was there ever anything like it? Jenny, who had the key, squeezed past them at this, and ran through the kitchen to the scullery, where she filled the kettle and put it upon the gas ring to boil, looked round her for a moment with quick darting eyes, like a small wild animal at bay in a strange place, then drew a bucketful of water, turned up her sleeves, the skirt of her new black frock, tied on an old hessian apron of mrs cohen's with a savage jerk of the strings and dropping upon her knees started to scrub the floor the rough stone floor men traipsin in and out muckin up a place she could hear the murmur of men's voices in the kitchen and through it that traipsin of other men struggling with a long coffin on the steep narrow stairs on and on it went the agonized remembrance of all that banging, trampling, the swish of her own scrubbing brush, the voices round the table where old Mrs. Cohen had stood ironing for hours and hours upon end. Then the door into the scullery was opened. For a moment or so she kept her head obstinately lowered, determined that she would not look up. Then, feeling her own unkindness, she raised it and smiled upon Ben, who stood there, flushed, glowing, and yet too shamefaced to speak, smiling involuntarily as one must smile at a child. Well, that, that music stuff, I suppose it's burnt, he began, fidgeting from one foot to another, his head bent, ducking sideways, his shoulder to his ear. Her glance enwrapped him, smiling, loving, bittersweet. Things were not going to be as she had thought. None of that going out regularly to work, coming home to tea like other men. None of that safe sameness of life. At the back of her calm was a fierce battle. Then she rose to her feet, wiped her hands upon her apron, stooped to the lowest shelf of the cupboard, and drew out a pile of music. There you are, my dear. I didn't not burn it, a cause, well, I suppose as I sort of knowed all the time as you'd be wantin' it. Children. Well, one knew where one was with children, real children. But men, that was a different pair of shoes altogether, something you could never be sure of, unless you remembered, always remembered, to treat them as though they were grown up. Think of them as children. Now you take that and get along back to your friends and your plan and let me get on with my work. It'll be dark and tea time on us afore ever I've time to so much as turn around. That woman, said the fat shining man, as they moved away down the street, greasy with river mist, hang it all, where in the world are we to get a taxi? Commonplace little thing, a bit of a drag on him, I should think. Don't you believe it, my friend? That's the sort to give em, someone who will sort of dry nurse em, feed em, mind em. That's the wife for a genius, the only sort of wife. Mark my word for it. End of Story 17 Part 2